You're listening to Seattle Real Estate Podcast. Do you remember at the beginning of the coronavirus 2020, like like late fall 2019, just getting into the beginning of 2020, we had like a story or two out of China. It was like, oh, there's this this weird virus that's kind of going around and and then it just started rocking the stock markets. Well, we don't have a virus going around. We've definitely got some issues with the Chinese real estate market. We've already done one podcast on Evergrande. And now we've got another company, Fantasia, that is having some problems. They're not making not meeting their debt obligations. Repayment deadline came and went. Oh, not good. And we've got Evergrande. They've got an offer on the table or a, some kind of deal brewing, a brewing for uh, a big equity stake in that company to keep it afloat. Too big to fail, right? Remember that? Well, we're going to get into it. This is an ongoing storyline that I'm going to keep going with here because I think it's important and I think it could have some really extended um, impacts to worldwide markets. So we're going to keep going. Chinese proper. Uh, but before we do, I'll introduce myself. I'm Sean Reynolds. I own a couple of real estate companies. And I read the news from said real estate perspective. So Chinese property developer Fantasia just missed a $206 million repayment deadline. Uh Oh, that's not good. A sign that China's real estate woes extend beyond Evergrande. It's not just Evergrande. And that's what we keep hearing. So Chinese property developer Fantasia Holdings failed to repay a $206 million bond payment due on Monday. That was yesterday. Ooh, that's what the company said just two weeks after it said it had no liquidity issues. Hmm. So we've either got a communication issue or we're just trying to bury what's otherwise not a good situation or we're just lying to people. That could be as well, right? No liquidity issues. We're fine. Can you pay? No, no, we've got liquidity issues. Don't have the money. Sorry. Going to have to, going to have to repay you down the road, down the road. Would you take an IOU for 206 million? I mean, another one? The missed payments add to the already immense strain on China's real estate sector, which has been left exposed to the $305 billion credit crunch crunch from property giant Evergrande. All right, those numbers in in and of themselves seem big, but the amount of debt in the Chinese real estate market is insane, literally. But this article is saying that Evergrande is the most indebted company in the world. Is that true? I've I've seen that a couple of times and I'm like, uh, need need to check that out. I I mean, would Yahoo News lie to us? I mean, I don't think so, right? We've got to have some fact checking in there somewhere. Um, But the most indebted company in the world or any which way you look at it, they've got a lot of debt. Fantasia is worth $415 million, reported Reuters, a drop in the ocean compared to Evergrande's crisis. Fantasia. Are we at Disneyland or are we building real estate, developing real estate? It's hard to say, right? Maybe they they take that because it's an Americanized name and ah, what could go wrong if you have a company named after uh, American entertainment? Um, But it's so we're back to Fantasia worth 415 million. Its bond default contributes to fears that an imminent major collapse in China's property market could destabilize the whole Chinese economy, which in turn could destabilize our economy. You've got these markets that are so in- intricately linked. And that's why that's why we're talking about this. It's not that I'm, you know, crazy on Chinese real estate market. I'm the Seattle real estate podcast, so we're a little more local, but this has some pretty major implications in my book. Fantasia, based in Sichuan, is involved in developing around 127 million square feet of land and manages a total of 47 projects, mostly for mixed residential and commercial use as of June, according to its 2021 interim report. So think 
like retail here in America would be the equivalent to here in the US would be the equivalent of to you know, a mid rise, maybe a moderate high rise, a lot of apartments or uh, office uh, units on the upper floors and on the first few floors would be retail, something like that, some kind of mixed use like that. So 47 of those bad boys and a bunch of land and the land to build them. So it took a senior note bond worth 500 million in 200, 2016 that was due this year, said the company in a Monday exchange filing. But when the deadline arrived, it still had 206 million of the repayment left outstanding, it said. So there's the 206. All right. So we've paid 294 of that down, but we got, we got just a smidge to go, a little bit to go. The board and the management of the company will assess the potential impact on the financial condition and cash position of the group under the circumstances, read the statement. In other words, we're looking into it. Everybody's looking into it. We don't really know what's going on. We'll get back to you. All right. On the other hand, Fantasia chairman Pan Won, Hoon, uh, said two weeks ago that its operating performance is good with sufficient working capital and no liquidity issue. Performance, good. We've, we've got enough working capital, no liquidity issues. Mm. Well, maybe that's true. Maybe they are just holding back cash because uh, they see the tsunami of issues coming. I don't know, but some of those statements... Probably not accurate is what I'm going to go with. Meanwhile, one of Fantasia's subsidiaries, uh, subsidiaries failed to pay a separate $108 million loan that was also due on Monday, said Country Garden Holdings, China's biggest property developer. And that was per Bloomberg. Fitch Ratings also reported that Fantasia had taken $150 million in bonds, but the developer didn't appear to disclose this in its financial statements. Doing a little borrowing on the side. Hmm. Credit rating agency downgraded its appraisal of Fantasia from B to triple C, meaning that the real estate company has substantial credit risk and might default. Oof, that's not good. Hmm. So that's where Fantasia sits. Let's go back. Let's take an interrelated look at Evergrande and see what they've got going on. So another billionaire and right now we've got the uh, we've got that Facebook whistleblower. She's they're doing live stream at um, uh, I think a Senate hearing. That's pretty interesting to watch. I watched uh, a good segment of her sixty minutes the other day, and um, super interesting stuff. It all makes sense. None of it surprises me. I think a lot of the social media stuff has been uh, been pretty self serving to the companies that uh, that drive these mediums. Speaking of which, we're going to be doing some uh, making some change ups before I jump into this other article here, we're going to be making some change ups to the podcast, nothing that's going to rock your boat, it's going to get better. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be separating kind of the Seattle real estate podcast from what we actually do. And this has been in the works for a long time, the content of my podcast is going to remain exactly the same probably going in some more directions that you as the viewers would like to see. So there's going to be less confusion about is this a real estate podcast? Because he's talking about a lot of other stuff that's not really real estate. I'll no longer have to kind of justify. So we're going to rebrand completely. We're going to keep doing the two podcasts a day, Monday through Friday. Content's going to stay the same, whatever that is, whatever that looks like in the news, that's not going to change at all. But the branding is all going to change. And I want your help as the viewers, as the listeners, on what we're going to name it. So lots of ideas out there, um, news for reasonable people, you know, things, things along those lines. The Seattle conservative podcast, and we're just throwing out, we're literally throwing stuff against the wall, seeing what sticks. Some of the factors are, I come from a business background, it would be cool to entail that. I, you know, I'm not super young, I'm 52. So we've got kind of this, this perspective of that's a little bit deeper than a lot of perspectives you'll see in social media. I'm from Seattle, which is a lot of people go, Oh, Seattle, that place is just going to burn to the ground. But hey, let's watch it. So you know, 
I think it's interesting that people identify with, hey, there's somebody that's reasonable in Seattle. Weird. So, so we're looking for name for the podcast that kind of encapsulates that. And then also some slogans like news for reasonable people, something along those lines, things that I say or things that that come up. So we're going to be asking through a series of um, probably some polls on YouTube. And I'll tell you when those come up, we're going to be asking for your input. But if you want to just start sending stuff to me, Sean, S E A N at Seattle real estate podcast.com. Tell me what you'd like to see. And we're going to do something pretty cool for people. Um, the, the person who comes up with the idea. Um, and who knows, maybe we take a couple of different ideas from a few of you out there and kind of cram them all together, but we're going to do something along those lines. But we're going more in the direction of where this podcast actually is. That'll allow us to kind of uh, line up a lot of the algorithms. Right now, we're like, well, your Summit Properties, your Seattle Real Estate Podcast, and yet you've got this you know, right of center content. Which one is it? What are you doing? So that's what we're doing. So we're going to start uh, dialing that in a little bit further. And I'd like your help on uh, helping us pick out some some names and content, you know, just that stuff. And then we're going to start doing the merchandising thing and going to be a real podcast, right? I mean, and some of the struggle has been that, um, you know, this podcast grew pretty quickly. And when you have it grow that quickly, you want to keep the content going, you want to keep that rotation coming. And I want to be able to provide the content and yet trying to figure out, all right, what is the content that everybody wants to see that will fit within our channel? We've been trying to, you know, manage all those different moving parts. And now we're going to line it all up a little bit more correctly. And, um, That'll help everything be just more dialed in from a, uh, not only a consumer perspective. Hey, what are we watching? Is it the Seattle real estate podcast? Is it some real estate brokerage? Is it just some guy talking about, you know, semi conservative stuff? Don't really know, but you'll know after the rebranding happens, but nothing will change as far as what I do, which is I record, you know, three podcasts a day sometimes less when we have mistakes, like when I don't turn the audio on, which is this bad boy, mm, doesn't work out well when I do that. All right. So that's that. Love to have your input when um, just whenever. So just let me know if you have ideas, send them to me. All right. Back to our regularly scheduled program. Another billionaire helps China's Evergrande with a stake purchase. Mm, all right. So we've got money coming in to scoop up a little bit of Evergrande because they seem to be impacting the market due to their, maybe some of their financial difficulties going on. All right. So let's see, let's see what's going on here. Another billionaire tycoon appears poised to come to the aid of embattled developer China Evergrande Group. Okay. So did podcast, I think last week we covered this whole story of, oh yeah, it looks like they might default on some pretty significant debt. And they did. There's the update. They did. So they need some help. They need an equity partner. Here we go. I will step in and take ownership of your company for the low, low price of whatever it is. Hobson Development Holdings Limited, a Hong Kong listed real estate firm controlled by the billionaire Chu family, has agreed to buy a controlling stake in Evergrande's property services business. Kellyanne reported Monday, citing people it didn't identify. Hmm, they shall remain anonymous. But trust us, it's true. Evergrande Property Services Group Limited said in a statement that its shares were halted on Monday due to a pending announcement of a possible offer for shares of the company from folks citing that shall remain unidentified. All right, a possible pending announcement of a maybe of an offer for shares of a company from I mean, it sounds like it's going to happen, right? I mean, what what could possibly go sideways on any of this? No, nah, I think that well, it was just that's kind of a funny, a funny written sentence, you can poke easy fun at some of this stuff. And you're like, okay, but yeah, they kind of had to, they had to couch it that way. The Chews could become the latest wealthy family to shore up finances for Evergrande and its billionaire founder, Huai Kai Yun, 
Hoy's so-called poker pals, poker pals, all right, have included it. And I have kind of heard about it, just uh, like a social circle uh, that Hoy runs in, have included Chinese Estates Holding Limited, Joseph Lau, New World Development Company billionaire Henry Chang, and CC Land Holding Limited's Chung Chung Q. I butchered that. I'm not really sure. Chong Chong Q. How about that? I, I do. I'm, I'm used to some Chinese names. The more complex ones, I you know, I I, tr- I can get after a couple of times, but I need to have somebody say it in uh, in the native tongue. How's that? Uh, though some have been scaling back their Evergrande investments. Mm, yeah, yeah, we're gonna ease off. We're gonna we're gonna curtail our investments in Evergrande because it's not looking good. Anything, I think anything real estate related in China at this point in time is kind of a, let's take a little step back and analyze our situation, maybe rethink, reimagine what might happen if this doesn't work out. In contrast to Hua, Huai, who is, um, sorry, Huai, who has been in the spotlight for years in the property sector, Chu Mang Yi is described as an invisible magnet by Chinese media for his low profile. Chu and his son, Chu Yat Hong, own about 71% of Hobson Development combined, and the family is worth about $6.2 billion, according to Bloomberg Billionaires Index. Mang Yi's daughter, Chu Kut Yong, has been the developer's chairman since January of 2020, so we've got a family business going on. Like Evergrande, Hobson is based in the southern province of Guangdong, listed on the Hong Kong uh, Stock Exchange since 1998. The shares have gained 40% this year. That's a that's a sharp rise. While Evergrande has plunged 80%. Opson has a market value of Hong Kong 60 billion, which is 7.7 billion in US dollars, compared with just Hong Kong 39 billion for Evergrande. Much bigger company better capitalization. Now, well, if they got the money to, uh, to to look at Evergrande, you know, better shape than Evergrande, right? In the early 2000s, Popson was once seen as the five, one of the five biggest developers in southern China, along with Evergrande, Country Garden Holdings Company, Gangzhou R&F Properties Company, and Agile Group Holdings Limited. Agile Group Holdings Limited. I like that name. What's your business model? We're agile. We just get around, just got movements. It was also the first property developer in China to reach sales of 10 billion won or $1.55 billion in 2004, according to Kalyan. Peers, including Evergrande and Country Garden, later surpa- surpassed Hobson to be the faces of China's real estate market. And yet... They're still kind of coming around and uh, we've got a little bit of a lower profile. However, we'll, we'll buy a little stake in your company. The developer is comparatively little known globally. I mean, do you want to be globally known? I mean, some people do, right? I mean, they just do you know, just massive egos. I like the ones that are less well known, a little more under the radar, a little more off the beaten path as far as the whole publicity thing goes. You can do it. But when you're building big buildings and massive swaths of real estate, that's pretty tough to do. So comparatively little known globally, even though it's the 13th biggest property company in China by market capitalization, if you're in the top 1,000, you're enormous. Let's be honest, just due to population of, of, of China. Hobson Development plans to acquire a 51% stake in Evergrande Property Services to value the company at about 40 billion Hong Kong, a 28% discount to the unit's current value of Hong Kong $55.4 billion. All right. So call it, call it 28% discount, saying it's worth $55.4 billion. They're going to pay $40 billion. And this is uh, after amending an earlier report on the valuation. Oh, we're going to need to change that up just a little bit. Here's here's the new offer. Evergrande took the property unit public in December. All right. So this is not, uh, this is the Evergrande Property Services. 
This is not uh, this has not been publicly traded for that long. Hobson's dollar notes are set for their biggest losses on record following the report. The 6.8% dollar bond due 2023 sank 5 cents on the dollar to 90.1 cents. Bloomberg compiled prices show as of 1 p.m. in Hong Kong. So things are down in the Chinese real estate market. You've got people stepping in. How long till this spills over to the U.S. market? So we are, are we at the outset of you know, some real, you know, number of sequential items happening that ends up with just a uh, global, global financial markets just in turmoil. Didn't take that much. I mean, look at look at how in 2008, in the whole 2006, 2007, 2008 thing, how that unwound, that wasn't good. And the debt that, that these companies in China have, I mean, it is staggering. If you start looking at some of the reports of exactly how much debt they've taken on, that's how they're building out. They're just taking on money. And now the Chinese government is basically, and if I'm incorrect on this, I know you'll let me know in the comments. But from my understanding, the Chinese government has limited the ability of the real estate developments, real estate developers ability to borrow. So when that happens, you've basically got I hate to say it, but you've got like a Ponzi scheme, you need to keep bringing in more money to pay people out make these you know payments on bonds. Otherwise, you're gonna have to have somebody come in and buy a portion of your company at a discount, say a quick 28% discount. My thought there is all right, if they're the kind of the, the first big company through the shoot here that we know of, how many others are out there just right behind them, behind them with the same thing? Um, is that is that what's going on here? I don't know. There's prob- a bunch of you out there probably know this far better than I do because you follow this stuff much closer. But the gen, I, I felt like the general gist of this topic needed to be addressed. So we've got not just Evergrande, but we've got other companies that are what looks like to be having some insolvency issues. Let's put it that way. And um, is this going to royal the world markets? I, some people think so. I, I think it certainly could. Will the Chinese government catch it in time? I don't, will there be a big bailout? Too big to fail? I don't know. But um, I think it's important to touch on this and kind of keep touching on this so that we have, uh, you know, we kind of look at things from a more global situation instead of just, hey, homes are selling really fast because that's important, especially when you're the one selling the homes, but having an overview of what's going on of other things that could rock a market. And we always talk about something like that. What is it going to take to slow down the US real estate market. Interest rates going up? Yeah, absolutely. But there's still the demand. It's just that interest rates are at historically low. So do we go from, you know, crazy demand to typical demand, and you've still got a market with no supply. And I was reading something about one of our economists here, a a well known local economist. And um, he was saying, yeah, I'm really on board with the whole um, take a single family lot and, you know, give this uh, amend the zoning so you can build a duplex, a triplex or a fourplex, because that's going to help our affordability issue. And there are so many things out there like that, that just aren't going to work. That's a huge no go in my book, it just doesn't work that way. So what's it going to take? Because we've got this issue that everybody's aware of, we have lack of affordable housing, especially in a lot of West Coast cities. It's insane what what properties are going for here. It doesn't make any sense at all relative to way, where wages have been and specifically middle to lower class. That is going by the wayside. I mean, the dynamics are just getting wacky. So I often talk about what is it going to take to slow down the United States domestic real estate market, single family, you know, the residential market. Well, is it something like this? Certainly not going to help, is it? No, it's kind of like pointing at the defunding of the police and saying, well, that's the reason the murder rates are way up, the violent crime is way up, gun violence is way up. Well, no, but it also doesn't really help either, right? So at some point in time, 
we will have a slowdown with the US residential real estate market. And it could come from an external factor. Oftentimes, that is the case. That's what starts something. And then you're like, Oh, yeah, okay. And here's the deal with your market. So when you have something external like this, like, you know, real estate market, in another part of the world cratering, or what it appears to be teetering, at least with companies stepping in buying chunks of each other and defaulting on debt and stuff like that. That's kind of an indicator of, ah, oh, maybe we should pay a little attention to what's going on there. So that's, that's essentially what I'm doing here. Will it impact the US real estate market? Stay tuned. We'll find out because one way or the other, we'll know. We'll know in, in not too long. Sometimes it takes a while. Sometimes it comes a little bit faster. But um, yeah, I will keep following this one because I think this one is a, uh, this is a trend that's out there. Mm, yeah, we'll be looking at it. All right. Don't forget, let me know what you think. Name of the podcast should be, maybe what the byline should be, any of that stuff. Ideas for merchandising. Somebody uh, somebody sent me a note that was very helpful that I brought up in a uh, meeting with our uh, videographer and our producer. And one of the concepts was um, for a hat that said, I'm reasonable. I thought that was pretty funny because who isn't? who doesn't want to be identified as reasonable? It's funny, right? All right. So got to bring some humor to this stuff because uh, massive real estate companies cratering in China gets a little deep. Got to keep things a little bit on the uh, a little bit on the lighter side at times. So if we do that through some marketing and some, you know, identifying this podcast, that's what we're doing. All right. Thanks so much for being here. If you can hear the whining sound coming through the microphone, it's because the landscape company outside invariably on Tuesdays starts blowing right by the perimeter of our office complex and got that. All right. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being part of the Seattle Real Estate Podcast. I'll catch up with you soon. Until then, stay safe, make good choices, be reasonable. We'll talk soon. Bye. to subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell so you'll know when our next video is out.